Hello there. So uh, this is a raw, rough and ready recording of Types of Memory, Chapter 3 inside my book, Guide to Memory, to help meet demand, to help other teachers, to help uh, share some of the things that I know uh, with you. So I'm going to read parts of the book to the screen. I've got a few slides to help dual code the learning process as we go. I just want to start with this analogy first. Most of us can drive a car, but when it breaks down, you know, so at least we can put petrol and diesel in, we might be able to change the, the wheel on the tire uh, when we have a puncture, but we don't really know how it works. So the question when we flip this analogy to teaching and learning is we can make kids behave, we can ask lots of questions, we can come up with fancy marketing strategies to reduce our workload, but not very many of us know how learning happens. So we're teaching experts, but we don't really know what happens anatomically uh, to a granular level when we shape a new memory connection. So when neurons connect to one another. And this is just some of the things I've been reading and learning over a number of years now to try and enhance my teaching wisdom. I guess I'm left with this question now, are mechanics good drivers or better drivers than you and I because they can drive the car better because they understand it. So like teachers, we can teach most people's children uh, we struggle with our own, um, but if we know how learning happens, can we be a bit more efficient and effective? My argument is yes. So please bear with me. It's a, a recording. It's probably going to be a good half an hour long. Uh, I'm going to go through a few different kind of ideas and strategies just for you to enjoy and understand a little bit more about the kind of mechanics of the brain and how we learn. So before I go on to the the next kind of uh, kind of key parts of the book. Could you grab a bit of paper? I'm going to give you a little exercise. We just want to explore uh, a little demonstration of working memory at play. So if you're watching this in the UK, it'd be straightforward. If you're watching this outside of the United Kingdom, I suspect just adapt the idea to suit your own context. So for people watching, um, pen and paper, here's the question. So no cheating. Could you draw a quick 30 second doodle of the front side of a 10 pence coin? And if you're overseas, so, you know, just choose a coin uh, in your own country. And for people here in England or the United Kingdom, could you make a decision? Which way does the queen's head face on the front side of a 10 pence coin? Does she face to the left or to the right? And again, if you're overseas, then use that kind of same context with someone that you know is on the coin. Which way, left or right? So let me give you the answers to speed things up. But if you want to play along, there's a few quizzes as we go through the session. So there uh, she is, Queen Elizabeth II. We know King Charles will face to the left. We may or may not know what the letters mean. We know there's different designs on the back. But this is a good example of working memory that we might have stored this subconsciously to a point of automation. We've forgotten it. Now we're manipulating information, working memory. And we're talking about it right now. So this is now in our short-term attention, our conscious attention, so explicit memory. So I want to talk about lots of different types um, of ideas here with you uh, and go through some of the things that I've uh, learned over the time. I suppose to begin with, let me just put this diagram. So this is a great book from Tricia Taylor, published in 2019. And... Uh, the kind of uh, analogy of a wardrobe is a nice kind of beginner's guide, but don't let it kind of determine your forever assumptions of what memory is. It's, I guess, um, one of my favorite kind of beginning strategies for understanding what memory is and how it functions, so that wardrobe metaphor. So to be able to find information, or indeed our clothes, um, we need to regularly retrieve the information. So metaphors are always useful but they can lead to oversimplification. So for example, if I'm trying to find a white shirt in this wardrobe, um, are the lights on or off, for example? I, am I in a rush or do I have lots of time? How big's the cupboard? Is the shirt at the top or the bottom? And so on and so forth. So there's many permutations and many factors, but this is a good little kind of beginner's guide to understand that if it's tidier, it's easy to categorize and easier to find information. So that's the first kind of key thing to consider. Now, the other thing, when we get into the kind of biology of the brain, here's a single neuron. Now, the research I've read, we've got in an adult brain between 86 and 100 billion neurons. So let me give you a kind of context. If I ask you to count to 1 million, it will take you 11 and a half days. If I ask you to count to 1 billion, 
take you 31 years. So 86 billion, um, unfathomable really. Uh, so, so there's many permutations with memory. And, and on this slide here, you know, there's lots of definitions, but we're looking critically here at this blue area. So in reality, it's a white gooey substance. And this is the, the kind of myelin sheath that strengthens our neurons and the transmitting connections or the neurosignals between different neurons. And I think if we, you know, it's important to translate and define all this kind of in, uh, information, but if we think about um, information that cannot be retrieved, uh, there's many things that we can remember that uh, we are things that we can't, but we will know what retrieval practice is and we become accustomed to this over the years. So for example, a good definition of retrieval is write it or say it. And if I can retrieve it and form that connection, we get two connections of neurons. Now, they don't physically connect. They form a, what's called a synaptic cleft. So that transmission, that electrical transmission can connect between one another. So these are just some of the things that I've been uh, reading up on. So I guess just for this context, I want to bring chapter three of my book, Guide to Memory to Life, in a little kind of recording such as this. And I'll leave some of the slides on, but I'll do largely just talking to the screen. And I'm going to read my book as I go through. So I hope uh, you enjoy it. But I'd like to unpick different types of memory, consider how deeply we can use this information to support or hinder the learning process, the development of memorization, discuss some of the techniques that teachers can use with their students to help develop a deeper understanding of how we learn. And this supports revision and self-study. Uh, and I think back to my teacher training, it was a gap that was missing. I've spent the last 10 years in particular plug in the gap. So I'm going to just put on the screen just to kind of give you a bit of help. So these are the 10 chapters in the book. Okay. And I'm exclusively talking here about types of memory to so chapter three. Okay. And it's not a formal record. I'm just doing it on my own here. And I'm playing this back to you to the big wide world. And you're watching this at some point in the future. And I hope you find it useful. So I'm going to show a few graphics. But the cartoon I'd like to share with you that's exclusively to chapter three is this one. So let me put it on the screen. There it is. And I'll go through the different parts. And I've got a few images that I'll show you along the way. Um, so we'll do that as we go through. So I'm going to start off with short term memory. And I'll pop back to this uh, screen in a moment. So I'm just going to pop over to I've got a couple of slides to go forward. I'm just going to dwell on this graphic for a moment. So short-term memory, this involves um, information in our conscious attention. So right now, if you're still with me uh, and you're watching in this moment, uh, I might say a set of numbers, ask you to repeat them back straight away. These will be held in your short-term memory or your working memory if I ask you to repeat them. And conversely, if you were asked to repeat them back in five minutes time or in 30 seconds time, you either transfer them to your long-term storage, manipulate them, and repeat them back, you know, in acoustic or a verbal manner. So short term is necessary it's a, um, for learning. It involves our hippocampus, and the hippocampus is integral to the formation of new memories. Now, I didn't know before. I knew we had one, but I didn't know we had two, one on each side of our brain. And this is what helps us consolidate memories. Uh, and, you know, if you want to know a little bit of detail, it's our verbal memory generally speaking on the left the hippocampus on the right spatial memory and the word hippocampus comes from the greek word hippos which means horse campos meaning sea monster so hence seahorse or sea monster so if i pop back to my little graphic here on the cartoon so let me just pop back some slides um we've got the kind of you know not correct uh, diagram but broadly speaking as a little simple graphic a little kind of introduction to what the hippocampus is, where it is, it's uh, you know its general location as part of the limbistic, uh, limbic system in our brain, um, and it resembles a seahorse. So there you go. Now our short-term memory, so over here on this graphic, it's limited capacity. In other words, we can only hold a certain amount of information in our short-term memory at one time, and it's a critical point to add that our prefrontal cortex, that area that manages our executive functions, such as self-control, planning, decision-making, problem-solving, this helps us consolidate our short-term memories and our long-term memory. 
So let's just do a little recap, I suppose, on this part. It's concerning our memories, receiving conscious attention. It involves our hippocampi, our prefrontal cortex, and it has a limited capacity. So let me just pop back to my three diagrams. Apologies for popping back and forward. So conscious attention, static, conscious, explicit in the moment. Long-term memory is where we store large amounts of information and they're waiting to be of service. Now, when we describe long-term memory, broadly speaking, these are memories that are not receiving any conscious attention. It's information that's been acquired and consolidated, and it can be retrieved if you want to recall it. So, for example, when was your 33rd birthday, if you're that old? What were you wearing? Perhaps you may or may not remember. How do you tie shoelaces? Some of these things become automatic and can be retrieved quite easy. So many teachers who are already exploring working memory will be familiar with Atkinson and Schifrin 1968 model. Now bear with me here. The research on dual storage model of memory, this model has argued that if we continue rehearse in the short-term memory, without it being rehearsed, it gets forgotten. But through rehearsal and association with prior knowledge, when information is transferred to long-term memory, the more we retrieve the information, the stronger its trace will be. So the phrase rehearsal buffer is used here in the Atkinson and Schifrin paper. And there's an interesting diagram, if you're familiar with it, about that rehearsal stage before it transfers, uh, before information gets lost. And so we start to understand with this cartoon, the analogy, the wardrobe metaphor, perhaps the funnel. Uh, so if you imagine the side silhouette of uh, someone's head and there's a funnel going down and it gets small at the top, then... Uh, the funnel depicts that information squeezed through a tight space and it might be lost. So this model's heavily criticized in the years since its publication. And even the authors admit that, you know, it dates back many years now. So the world's moved on since 1968. And whilst I don't claim to be a cognitive scientist, I'm confident that uh, the industry, cognitive science and education has a deeper understanding of how the brain functions and its components and where various neurons are activated, analogies, metaphors, and diagrams can help us get to grips with memory, but they can sometimes be misleading. So let me just pop back the slide to this little model. I'm going to leave this here just as a little primer for you. So priming means preparing. So my analogy as a DT teacher, I think, undercoat, a layer. So here's preparation of things to come. Now, some of you know Guy Claxton, so one of the most uh, well-known cognitive scientists here in the UK. That phrase, cognitive architecture, is also a metaphor, uh, of course. So architects design solid structures, uh, things that keep their shape and are meant to last. That metaphor implies that the most important things to know about the mind are also structural. But things have moved on again from this model and are not really universally accepting you know, that monolithic mental architecture. But new discoveries show that, you know, when we divide the brain into a series of stores and processes, new discoveries show the idea of separate rooms shunting information between them is a falsehood. So rather what's happening in the brain is a much more fluid and dynamic model. So, you know, the left and brain, left and right brains are a bit of a myth, but, you know, we've got, kind of got this principle here on the screen here. We're starting to really get into the learning process a bit more. So we know a bit more. So we'll just do a recap here. Let's just pop back to my little graphic here. Long-term memory. So it concerns our memories that are not conscious in the moment. So what did you have for dinner last night? What was the color of your first car? Not conscious attention. Information that has been acquired or consolidated. It might last for a day, a week, a year, forever over our life. It lasts over an extended period of time. So that's the kind of beginnings. Now, let me just push it a little bit forward. We're going to kind of explicit and impl impl explicit memory here. Now, long-term memory can be divided into different categories. So this green box here on the screen, explicit and implicit. So explicit and implicit memory form two parts of our long-term storage. And our long-term memory can be modified with ongoing experiences. So in the classroom, this may be repeated exposure to concepts, rules, and facts. So for example, concept is the life on Mars, fact, uh, who's the first wife of Henry VIII, rules two plus two equals. And if we break it down, so explicit, we can 
consider conscious retrieval, verbal, declarative. So declarative means I can declare. And within this, we have semantic and episodic. So semantic memory, uh, very quickly, is our concepts, rules, and facts. Episodic memory, episodes, our personal experiences. So your birthday, who makes you who, you're the star of the show. Inside the long-term memory, we've got unconscious retrieval. So there might be a background noise while you're watching this. You learn to ignore it. Um, you know that you're sitting down, you're drinking tea. So all those kind of unconscious automated learned uh, processes, nonverbal, procedural, emotionally based, and also that priming. So I'll put that graphic back up on the screen, priming you for what's to come. So if we move a little bit more into episodic and semantic memory, so this is in our long-term storage here, this green area. Episodic memory. So what did you have for dinner last night? Episodic memory is our recollection of personal events and experiences in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's no different to develop a degree of phrenesis or wisdom in our classrooms as we gain experience. So we think of our life memories as episodes. The best definition I can give you of episodic memory is how you remember certain aspects or life events or dates. They're easier to recall because of the, you're the movie star in the show. And that retrieval of information strengthens those neuron connections over time. So, But in the context of episodic memory, Memory retrieval can sometimes, you know, alter the memory. So with every year we repeat and therefore recall, it might become unreliable over time. So we remember our birth date, but not necessarily the specific things that happened on each of the days of our birthday. So what you're wearing, what you had for dinner, who you were you with. So we can't necessarily remember those specifics. So episodic memory is a thought dependent process. So that left hippocampus again. So I'll pop back to the cartoon graphic. Here we go. So that image in the middle, two on each side. So the left hippocampus, generally speaking, helps shape images and so memories. It produces our autobiographical story. And we use this to shape images, music, and ideas in autobiographical form. So a good example, think of all the pop bands you like, the, the music, different ages, so 10, 18, 25, 40 years old, and... You'll have a milestone or a memory associated with a feeling, an emotion perhaps, and you can recall the lyrics. Why can't we remember lyrics to songs quite easily? So I'll give you an example of episodic memory recently. Uh, where were you when the COVID-19 pandemic really took hold in your country? So if we pop now to semantic memory, another example of that question, what did or when did the pandemic hit your country? So you've got when. Did the COVID pandemic begin? So that's semantic. Episodic, well, how were you feeling? Where were you? Can you remember? What were you wearing? So semantic memory is the recall of concepts, rules, and facts. The fact was the pandemic hit our country on X date. And this is commonly regarded as general knowledge or etymologically speaking, the origins of the word semantic derive from the Greek sema, so meaning sign or I've pronounced this wrong, perhaps, but semanian, uh, semanian, I'm trying to read this properly, apologies, meaning signify. And the word was used from the mid-17th century in French as semantique. So this literal meaning is semantic or to show a sign. So I can retrieve that Catherine of Aragon was the first wife of Henry VIII. I've showed a sign, I can declare it, I can say it, I can write it. So the answer to the question, when did the COVID pandemic begin? That answer to the question is a fact. So the question about asking about your experiences during the pandemic is a personal memory uh, and a touch on reliable. And of course, episodic memory and semantic memory can interact in our everyday lives. So for example, if you have a drink to hand on your table at work, or as you're watching this, you recognize that it's in a particular cup, a ceramic cup, an aluminium cup, got a, a liquid inside coffee tea or a can of coke you can confirm it's good or not good for you unless you drink it in moderation semantic memory but it's your favorite drink because it reminds you of maybe lying on the beach during the summer holiday so that's your episodic memory so when we teach concepts rules and facts let's pop back to this graphic 
So I'm priming this again. Semantic memory is the bread and butter of the classroom. And we use this model in code, store, retrieve. So we help students to recall, recognize, and relearn curriculum materials involving students to shape their semantic memory over time. And one way teachers do this really well is connecting students' personal episodic experiences to their semantic knowledge. So when we allow personal experiences to shape more abstract concepts, so we tell stories, we take kids to the farm, to the ski trip, or whatever it might be, it's a powerful methodology for teaching. So when we start to think about cultural capital and students with no prior personal experiences that are relevant to the curriculum content, we start to see how every classroom is not a level playing field. This is the reality of schools. And when high stakes exams are involved, the challenge becomes a moral dilemma for us all. We want to give all our students the sufficient knowledge in order to be successful, but it's easier for some students than it is for some. So let's pop back to my little graphic here. Let's put it all back on the screen. A little recap. So short term's conscious right now. Working memory, who was the first wife of Henry VIII? What's two plus two? Uh, what's the second planet in the solar system? So I quiz you. I re uh, quiz rather than reteach. Long term memory. So we're building schema. So we add further knowledge. We categorize information. Tomato ketchup. Is it a source? Is it a vegetable or is it a star? Well, those options are too easy. I'm not strengthening your retrieval. I need to make it harder. So we can start to see how we form concepts, rules, and facts. We shape memory, waiting to be of service, that unconscious long-term memory, and we make it explicit, implicit, and we can declare it. So declarative knowledge, I can write it, I can say it. So let's just pause a moment for implicit memory. So implicit memory is our non-episodic, so no episodes, not personal experiences, abstract, subconscious. These memories are often influenced by per previous experiences, so everyday skills such as reading a book or walking, uh, and they involve a degree of automation, so it's subconsciously produced. Non-declarative memory doesn't involve the use of our hippocampus. So once these memories are formed, uh, they do not involve any conscious work. So you can do a lot of things. So I'm sitting down. I've got a drink to hand. I've got two screens on here. I'm recording this. I'm, I've got some slides. I'm uh, automating some things to a degree. Uh, so they don't involve too much conscious work on my part because I do this regularly and lots. So, for example, for you, how did you manage to tie your shoelaces this morning? You probably don't even remember consciously thinking about it. So previous experiences help us perform these tasks better without much of what we did before. So there's also an element of our implicit memories that you know they're strongly linked to our emotions. And it's important to distinguish this from our episodic memory. So episodic memory is about personal events and experiences that we consciously recall. Whereas we also think about implicit memories are emotional and unconscious uh, and they can influence our behavior. So for example, you may have developed an unconscious condition response when you drink a glass of milk. Maybe you had an experience when you were a child that it was off, it was cold, it was creamy, and it, it kind of made you think of not liking milk for the rest of your life. So we have that fight or flight response, which is part of our amygdala. So there's lo lots of things we can talk about here. So let me just pop over to uh, another slide. So some of the things I've been doing, you know, just looking at not just the neurons, but parts of the brain and what they're responsible for. So these are just kind of key, a key overview, but you can get into the, the regions of the brain, the body parts of the, you know, the functions, the body parts, the names, all the technical stuff. And I found it quite an interesting journey. And I kind of guess what I've done here is just give you the kind of headlines to think back to that process. Can you drive the car better if you know how it works? So if I just leave this graphic on for a moment, I just want to kind of skip a few different bits to this, but I guess I just want to finish off with working memory. Um, so I want you to imagine you're sitting on a desk writing my book, so types of memories. Oh, this actually happened. It was the end of a long working day, and I'm exploring a new concept where I've got some prior knowledge. I've got two screens to hand, voice dictation, so I'm speaking to my microphone, over 15 or so book references to hand, countless academic papers, and 10 or 20 audiobooks that I've been dipping in and out of. And in between reading and writing, the phone rings, and then an email pings in my inbox. 
But somehow the phone takes priority, doesn't it? And as the opportunity to pick up the phone's limited, I can either choose to pick it up or ignore it. I know there's a voicemail option now, which is good. I guess back to the old days, you had to pick up that hand dial phone. So instinctively, we make a decision to pick up the phone because we know that we can maybe uh, read an email later so the phone takes priority. Or if I'm at a doctor's uh, reception desk, the phone rings and I'm talking to the receptionist, they're likely to pick up the phone and take that precedence over me waiting there physically. So the good examples of how working memory starts in the realities of our day-to-day -day work. So the person on the end of the other phone knows no different. They speak very quietly or not. So you've never spoken to them before. And they then make an inquiry about you know, what you're doing or can you give me a bit of help? So as I might put the phone back down, I get distracted by an email, a notification. I completely forget that I was deeply focused on this webinar with you, this recording, or writing the actual book. So my mind now wanders away into what am I having for dinner later tonight? At what point will I stop watching this video, this recording, recording this or reading and writing? And as I, as the rate of information increases, my performance levels on the original task doing a presentation to you is now seriously in decline. So I suspect like me, your everyday work is also similar to the scenario I've just described. And teachers we know struggling with lots of different decisions every day. And we learn to become more efficient, but our working memory can be improved its efficiency, but it is limited. So my example of what I've just described is how our memory can be impacted by a variety of different information scenarios. And selective attention can help here. So good piece of research, KU, so KU 2018, states that given the restricted resource on working memory, it's essential to rely on selective attention. And we have to work hard, I suppose where that goal-directed focus on certain aspects on the environment and ignoring everything else going on or relevant, irrelevant aspects helps us process information more efficiently. So the above or the, the scenario I've just described is a perfect example. And you're either with me or you've disappeared a long time ago or you've paused this and come back because I suspect where you are um, in uh, you know on the receiving end of this video is you're watching lots of other different things and getting distracted too. So it's easy for us all to become very distracted. Now let me pop off this cartoon and go back to the encode saw retrieve. So there's my primer, but I'm going to go whiz past my little working memory slides here and pop on to this encode saw retrieve model, which is another great reference from Tricia Taylor's book and Ollie Caver did an illustration. Oops. And leave this here for a moment as I just kind of wrap things up a little bit. So describe how working memory happens. It's uh, an immediate uh, part of our memory. It's not, shouldn't be confused with short term, but you know, some cognitive scientists say the, the same two things. So I need to explore that a little bit more with my limited teacher wisdom. But while short term memory, at least simply stores static information, working memory processes or manipulates several different pieces of information. So let me just tell you what I know here, I suppose. We know that our working memory is a limited capacity. However, with practice, it can be increased. We know that if we try to do too much, we cannot do any of the tasks adequately, so we either quit or fail. So these limited factors could be a combination of the individual activities that were assigned, trying to complete, and our ability or the skills that are required in the involvement of the task. And I've read lots of different bits of research, and they generally quote, on average, as an adult, that we can manipulate between three to nine bits of information at once. And we tend to forget within 15 to 30 seconds. So as teachers, we work hard to be a bit more effective in delivering instruction in order to help the learning process. So I guess if I just pop back this graphic too, um, let's pop back to just this red area. So on the left here, we've got Classroom environments, online home environments. We've got all neurodiversity, which I've not even talked about here. All the learning needs, ADHD, dyspraxia. So already that's a minefield. But if we just pause to the middle, the critical thing to mention is you cannot learn if you're not attentive. So teachers must command attention. So one, two, three eyes on me before they deliver instruction. So do this next. Now, the things I've read in this red circle, we can, as adults, we can manipulate between three to nine bits of information. We forget it after 30 seconds. 
And as a broad rule of thumb, there's a great book called Memory in the Classroom by Bailey and Pranksky. It was published in 2014. And I've got a slide somewhere, so you can ask me for it if you're interested. But it kind of looks at a child's age and says that broadly this is the kind of work and attention, um, kind of paying attention span. So I'd, I'm a bit cautious about that. But it's a good broad rule of thumb that if you take a child's age, you know, a year, a year six student, so 10 years old, looking at about 10 minutes of deep focus before we need to pause the process, consolidate, retrieve, move forward again. So it's a good kind of principle, and I'd encourage you to read a little bit more of it. So you've got this encode, store, retrieve model. We've got this transfer word in the middle here where we learn the hypotenuse theory, for example. I can remember it, and I've processed this through short work and then now into long term. But now when we talk about metacognition and transferring what we know into unfamiliar uh, kind of scenarios, when we transfer this into our far long-term storage, we can apply it in new scenarios. So I know the hypotenuse theory. I now go outside. I look at the side of a building, and I need to get to the second floor. I've got these certain measurements. I need to work out the angle or the length of the ladder. I can apply hypotenuse in a new or unfamiliar scenario. So that's how we might think about working memory and transferring information into uh, application of another process. So if I just kind of show you what we do in our schools, uh, we have to have clear uh, curriculum plans, so that spiral knowledge in code, store, retrieve. We bring content to life through engaging stories. We command attention before we deliver scripted instruction. We pose questions. We provide feedback along the way. We provide meaningful, scripted, positive, challenging feedback. We model the learning process. We bring learning to life. Here's one I made earlier. I do, we do, you do. The coaching model, let me show you the process as you develop expertise. I fade away my support to help you develop uh, your wisdom. And then I guess in the middle, to help transfer, we scaffold different resources along the way. So I don't throw it all to you at once as you develop your skills i take things away to see how and what you do next so i guess you know as ever it all depends on you know the task at hand what the students know their age you know the subject the topic being taught how you teach it you know we get into cognitive load theory and cognitive apprenticeship and under what conditions all this makes a difference but here's a, just a good example so we just pop back to work in memory so this red area on the screen or if I just kind of reduce your load slightly, come back to more, more simplified version. So just give me a moment. So to here. A good example. So I've got two definitions of the book, so I'll just work them through with you now. Um, here's example one. So I, uh, you can either jot these down so I can make them easier for you. So you write these down. And if you don't get a pen and paper now, it's probably going to be harder. Or I can ask you to say them back to me. Now, as I'm recording this, I can't get you to say it back. But if I then say that the work in memory example that you can manipulate three to nine bits of information, here's an example. How, what are the colors of the rainbow? How do you spell my middle name? What is your date of birth? What's the second planet furthest from the sun in our solar system? So there's four questions. If I haven't prepared you for these questions, I suspect I'm going to get a weak response. If I do prepare, I give you a warning. We practice first. I keep testing you rather than reteaching you the material. I strengthen you and strengthen, sorry, I strengthen your retrieval over time. And then I can carry on. So what are the colors of the rainbow? How do you spell my middle name? What's your date of birth? What's the second last planet in the solar system? Where's Mount Vesuvius? In which year did Mount Vesuvius destroy the town of Pompeii? Have a guess if you don't know. In which, in which part of the brain is the telencephalon? Now, I've not taught you that, but uh, I could give you choices, top, bottom, front, or back. They're easier, multiple choice retrieval. So you can take a risk, you get a 25% chance. And then we can think about a part of the brain. So the cord, or how do you spell the cord, or where we store information stored in our telencephalon? So is it cord, or C-A-W-D-A-L? Is it C-A-U-D-A-L? Is it C-A-U-D-E-L or is it C-A-U-D-L-E? And then we think about working memory that we forget after 30 seconds. So I might say, right, so tell me where in this recording, um, what we were talking about before we started to explore this diagram. 
And I suspect you forgot. So we need to recap or retrieve. So I'm not going to teach you again. We need to retrieve. So the correct answer would be, you know, if you did go back and check the recording, um, the concept of working memory we're exploring and we're demonstrating how easy it is for teachers to support or hinder the learning process taking place. And if we regularly retrieve information and build on prior knowledge, we can start to have a degree of mastery. And if we overload this work in memory with too much information, we run the risk of our students entering cognitive loads and then where learning is lost. So intrinsic and extraneous load. Intrinsic is how difficult the topic is. So it's either tomato ketchup or it's corpus linguistics. So I suspect tomato ketchup is an easy topic for you to know about. You've got some prior knowledge. You can consolidate. We can build more schema. Corpus linguistics, you're either new to the topic or you know a little bit about it. And then the extraneous is how I teach it. So, you know, I've got this bit of software here and I've kept it quite straightforward, but I can um, turn my camera off. And I, in this context, virtual context, make the teaching harder. So the extraneous has got a few kind of other definitions, but one good practical example of for teachers is how I teach it makes a big difference to to how material is received. So let me just pop back to this diagram. So let's go back to the more detailed one. The encoded or retrieve model, what we do in our schools. And if we take it further, that's an old curriculum plan I wrote 25 years ago, and it still exists in schools today. And on the left, you've got the four pager of build a tower, sell a tape, working groups hang away from the top let's test it to destruction on the right the knowledge skills and assessment to, to be taught and assessed the hard work's already done the curriculum's built it's refined over time years and years of resource building etc so now i look at this as a cognitive scientist so i go back to the knowledge and skills before and i add the encode store retrieve and i identify key moments to develop knowledge over time the spiral knowledge, or I like to think of a spider web as an analogy, how the spider web first forms with the struts, the triangle, before the web connects and is built over time. And that's a great exercise for all of us to consider. And what a great schema work it would look like. We can have all sorts of boxes and fancy rows and columns, but ultimately we're looking for a space model so we don't block all our art lessons together at once. We squeeze them out over the academic year and we interleave our practice. We mix similar topics to help categorize and build. So uh, think of a fruit salad. We put apples, pears and bananas together. We don't put baked beans in it or sausage and potatoes. That's what goes with baked beans. So we mix similar topics to strengthen that uh, retrieval. So you can see here I've used structures and ergonomics as two similar topics. And over time, this gets a bit more complicated or not, depending on the context of what we're trying to achieve. So you've got lots in here. I guess just a couple of things that I can just finish. And I can go through a lot more, but I just thought I'd spend a bit more time going through some of my resources and just explaining types of memory for people and what it might look like in the classroom. If I just pop back to what we've got here. So these are the 10 chapters of the book. So there's lots more. So I've already really explored chapter three, which is this one. You've got your short term, your long term, your encode store retrieve model, a little kind of annotation of what the hippocampus is in our prefrontal cortex. And you've got this nice little flow chart over here of the, the differences between implicit and explicit and implicit memory, semantic and episodic. And hopefully that will help. Uh, you've also got, you know, this little uh, person here. Let me just pop over. We've got 100 billion of these and how we form a connection. And there's lots more you can read inside the book, you know, the different parts of the brain, what it all means. I guess my message here is if we know a little bit more granularly about how learning happens, we can drive the car more effectively. And for me as a teacher, it's taken me 15 years of teaching before I even started to explore this, and it's now taken me a further 15 years to get to this point where I wouldn't really say I'm an expert, but I know a lot more uh, that now than I did, than I didn't as a teacher. And I think, you know, what if I was taught this on day one? And a lot of our new teachers have been taught this today here in England. So there's a message for us all in our schools that we could probably make our teachers a lot more efficient if they understand how the how the car drives better not just being able to drive it but understanding how it works 
So on here, you've got uh, the QR code to the book itself. You want to read more. So at the moment, there's 10 cartoons. I've got an audio introduction to chapter three, which I've just showed you through in this video, but there's a greater version of it. And there's an audio sample here on the right of the introduction to the book as to why I've tackled this subject and why I believe it should be something that all teachers do at some point in the career. I guess the message is don't leave it too late. So I'm going to leave things there. I hope you've enjoyed watching this. Um, watch it back, share it with your colleagues. If you want me to bring it to life in a, in a webinar or in your school, then let me know. Um, other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you uh, somewhere else uh, online or physically in the future. Thanks for watching.